I'm the director of the Center for International Sport Business, and the CISB is the organization that sponsors these For the Love of the Games speaker series. Tonight is the 33rd speaker program in a series, and we're fortunate to have Tim Rustall, president of the Hartford Yard Goats here this evening. So let's give a warm golden bear welcome to Tim. So that version of Take Me Out, you notice the lyrics were uh, modified. And there's a reason for that. We're going to talk about that uh, this evening. But anyway, thank you again. As you know, this is a tradition with the CISB for the Love of the Game uh, speaker series, is that you as the audience, students in the audience, will have an opportunity to engage our guest, Tim Restow. So start thinking about your questions. Uh, in the meantime, Tim and I are going to have a conversation, like a fireside chat, and you can eavesdrop on the conversation and start thinking about the questions you'd like to ask, Tim. I'll say at the outset that the Yard Goats organization, under Tim's leadership, they've been uh, very nice to Western New England. Four alumni of Western New England University are employed by the Yard Goats organization, and Last week or the week before? Last, Last week. week uh, Tim's son committed. He signed his national letter of intent to play basketball here at Western New England. So he'll be on campus this fall. So we've got the Restall family in the uh, Golden Bear Nation here. You guys are all now FOTs, friends of Tim. Oh, all right. <laughs> all right. So, Tim, thanks again for coming up here and uh, welcome to Western New England yeah, University. Yeah, thanks, thanks for having me. I was, it's only like it was. 35 minutes up uh, 91 from the ballpark. I worked today, and it was a beautiful day. It's hard to believe that it's like close to 50 degrees at the ballpark, and the grass was green, and we had people in the ballpark walking around and gave a tour, and it's, uh, it's hard to believe baseball won't, will be here in 50-some-odd days. Yes. What is this, March 7th? March 7th, is it? A uh, April, April 7th. Yeah, April, it... April 9th, I think, is opening day. It's something like that. You're right. It's April 9th. 7, 10 p.m., Hartford, at Dunkin' Donuts Stadium, ballpark. So get down there. If you haven't been down there already, let me ask, show of hands, how many of you have been to the ballpark? Wow, Tim, wow. quite a few. That is, that's yeah, that's few. impressive, as the ballpark is impressive, right? Yeah, it's, a, you know, we're, it's definitely a crown jewel. It's, you know, we're going into our fourth season. It's a beautiful ballpark. It's a small ballpark. It's in right downtown Hartford. Um, 6,000 seats, so uh, pretty small compared to any type of major league facility, but 6,000 seats, we can hit, fill up to 6,850 fans. We sold out last year. We played 70 home games, and we sold out 51 of those games, which was uh, a big uh, feather in the hat to our staff and our uh, organization. We're getting fans to come out, and I don't even remember what our record was because on, on our side, the baseball is great but it's more about the entertainment, the promotions, the experience, the, the beer, the hot dogs, the, the, the merchandise, all those things we focus on. The baseball is great. We play great baseball, but it's not our, not our lead item. So I'll tell you what the record was. It was 73 and 66. Gotcha. Yeah, okay, yeah. In, in, in 2019. <laughs> I'll take your word for it. So... Uh, <laughs> But here's the more important point. The uh, Dunkin' Donuts ballpark uh, was number one in average attendance in 2019. They were number two the previous season and number three. So every year, except over the last three years, you've moved up in the ranks in the Eastern League so that you're, you're number one. How many teams are there in the Eastern League? There are 12 teams. They range anywhere from up to Portland, Maine, down in Richmond, Virginia, out west to Akron, Ohio. I believe there's four teams in Pennsylvania, and then there's teams in New Jersey, New York, uh, Maine, New Hampshire, and so on. All right. Tim, why don't you talk about how you got your start in the business? Because I know uh, you're not a classic baseball guy. You got started in the family entertainment business. Could you talk about that and then how you made your entree into baseball? Yeah, so I started uh, when I was working in high school. I decided that, uh, or going to high school, I needed a job. So I worked at a place called, up in New Hampshire, for, uh, called Canopy Lake Park. And I worked there in high school, I worked there in college, I, and I worked on the food service side. So um, 
over, you know, anywhere starting off as a fried dough cook, working my way up to a stand supervisor, working my up, way up to an area supervisor, and then eventually throughout high school through college, uh, it was a great summer job because I could work as many hours as the, I want. Back when I was 16, 17, they didn't follow labor laws too well, so I was able to work 100 hours a week. I always had money in my pocket, which was great as a high school student, and then continued that when I was in college, and then when I was done with school, got a full-time job, worked there 11 years, and worked my all, all the way up to assistant general manager, so on the food service side. So it seems a little unusual, but this is uh, kind of insightful for your students. Uh, sometimes you wonder how you get your foot in the door of an organization, and you think you have to be a sport guy or a gal, and uh, be a player or a coach or an administrator. In Tim's case, he was in um, food and uh, food and beverage services, and that was his first job as the food and beverage director for the New Hampshire Fisher Cats yep. in, in and, minor league. Yeah, absolutely. So I, from being, working at the amusement park, I decided one day, I'm like, you know, there's got to be something else out there, a new challenge. And that's when I saw an ad uh, in the... Uh, industry magazine for the West Michigan Whitecaps. So being from New England, all, you know, growing up outside of Boston in New Hampshire, always you know, a New England, New England guy, all of a sudden there's an opportunity to go work in Michigan for the West Michigan Whitecaps, which was a single A. Always loved baseball, was a Red Sox fan, you know, would always uh, enjoy going to Fenway Park, but never thought about working at, in baseball, and then I saw this ad so I, I applied for it. I, uh, I did something I highly don't recommend. I wrote a handwritten cover letter. That's how quickly I wanted to get my resume out there. So I sent it out there. And then eventually, uh, they contacted me. And then I worked four years out in West Michigan and then was able to come home to become the food and beverage director at the uh, New Hampshire Fisher Cats. And then rising to vice president for business operations with the Fisher Cats. And then in two, 2013, Tim became the general manager of the New Britain Rock Cats. And then 2016, when the Rock Cats relocated to Hartford to become the Hartford Yard Goats, Tim was named general manager and then president of the Yard Goats. And in 2017, Tim was named Eastern League Executive of the Year. So that's a pretty high honor and recognition of your contribution. Yeah. It, and it's a it's an individual award, but I one thing I always say is I'm not that smart. I surround myself with smart people, and I always want to make sure that our staff does a phenomenal job. And I'm very fortunate. That's why I decided to move from New Hampshire to Connecticut. Was that the staff that was running the New Britain Rock Cats was great, and that is such a big part of um, the organization because it you know you can have a logo, you can have a name. It takes people to make an organization work. It takes people to make a ballpark operate. And having the right people in those positions is very important. All right, let's talk about the um, stadium here. Hey, one of the guys, can you advance the, uh, actually, 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 I got it here. Sorry. All right, I should just turn on the clicker, right? Thank you, Connor. <laughs> so uh, this is your fifth season as, um, 2020 is your fifth season as the Yard Goats, but the fourth season in the uh, ball, ballpark, right? Correct. There was a little issue with the... There was a little issue that came up. Um, so in 2016, the ballpark was not... was So 2015... Um, sorry, I usually block this out according to my <laughs> therapist. Sorry, dude. That was, was, so, uh, but, but basically, the 2016, the team played a year on the road which was very difficult for multiple reasons. One is that we didn't have a home. So if you think about minor league baseball and the model, it's a business, correct? So it is ticket sales, food sales, merchandise sales, parking sales, sponsorship sales. That generates all the revenue. In 2016, we did not have a home. So the team played on the road, which is very difficult for the team, but also very difficult for the staff because a lot of our staff, or everyone, is growing in their position as, as employees. And then for one year, we had to put everything on, a, on pause. So a lot of prep, a lot of planning, a lot of communication all had to be put on hold because the ballpark wasn't finished. 
But eventually it got finished and we played baseball. And it, uh, April 13th, two, 2017, which actually was 20 years to the day that the Hartford Whalers, the NHL team, left Hartford, their last game. So a lot of people said that we were marketing geniuses that we tied it to that date. And the league actually picked the schedule, and it just happened to be that day. So. Are your uh, team colors, is that a um, play on the, uh, the Whalers, the, the color scheme? Absolutely. So it, it, uh, I, just, I just thought about that. Yeah, so be, because of Hartford and the Hartford Whalers, and those that don't know, back 20-some-odd years ago, the NHL took the team, and I always say ripped it out of the community because it was a, a sports team that was in the, in the market and moved them down to the Carolinas, we wanted to pay homage to the Whalers and respect, so we incorporated the blue and green in our logo, which has been one of the top selling logos in baseball and uh, does very well. Tim, talk about the park and your role in, in the construction and uh, you know, the appointments to the ballpark, because you, you were very much involved in that during the transition. By the way, um, Dunkin' Donuts Park has been named by Baseball Digest as the best minor league ballpark in AA in 2017 and 2018. And those of you who have been there can attest to that and why that is. But um, talk about the startup and getting it all situated and the clubhouse and the locker rooms and the executive offices the way you, you envision it to be. Yeah, so at the time we were building this, I had about 16 years worth of experience in baseball. We had a lot of staff that had experience in baseball. And so we were able to look at them, and we call them touch points. All the touch points that a fan would have, whether they, when they enter in the gates, they, go, they buy tickets, they go to the team store. We were uh, involved in all the decisions because we knew what a good ballpark would be, right? And so you... You take, a pair, you take a set of plans, you put it out, and then you're like, okay, this is what's going to work, this is what's not going to work. And it's before you even put one person in the building. So from having a 40-foot you know, by 80-foot video board that has a cup on top of it, Dunkin' Donuts cup, hence the name of the ballpark, Dunkin' Donuts Park, that will steam when there's a home run to having uh, dugout suites where you're sitting in the seats. When you're sitting there, you're sitting closer to the batter than the pitcher is. A lot of details that went into the uh, ballpark to make it the best fan experience that we could. Uh, I met Tim about two weeks ago. I went down to the park, and Tim was telling me at the construction time and opening day was looming, and uh, because they were still behind on some of the final touches, certain things were not done. And the contractor told Tim that, you know, we're not going to get that flagpole up in time. And tell me your react. Tell us your reaction. So, so um, if those that don't know construction, just to give you an idea, when you do a construction project, there is the construction company usually puts a bond up. The bond is insurance that the, ball, that the construction project will be delivered on time. I learned this in 2015, 2016. So when you don't hit certain guidelines, you can call the, the bond, like you call the insurance company, insurance company comes in, and then they have to deliver the product, deliver the building. That's what happened at Dunkin' Donuts Park. I just told you about 30 seconds of information that transpired over a year and a half, and hundreds of thousands of legal bills probably that was associated with it. But the insurance company came in to finish the ballpark, and the part of the, the, the discussion was that it needed to be baseball ready, right? So what's baseball ready? So baseball ready means putting people in the ballpark, you're able to play baseball. Those are the two, two things that they wanted to do. So as I was looking at the drawings and we were getting closer, we were about 45 days from opening day, I said, where's the flagpoles, right? You gotta have flagpoles at a ballpark. One of the first things you need to do before you play baseball is have the national anthem, right? It's, I'm not, I'm not a rocket science, I'm just I'm looking at basic information. So I, I asked them in a meeting, and they, they came back to me, and they had given me a heads up that in the construction meeting later on in the afternoon, they're going to tell me that they're not going to put up flagpoles. So I said, okay. And so I, um, uh, you know, we're the tenant, so we're the, we're the person that's renting the ballpark from the city, so we don't have any 
uh, input on design at this point because they're trying to finish it and they say, you know, Tim, just to let you know, there won't be a flag, there's no flagpoles by opening day. So I said, and I'm a very con, you know, conservative person, and I sit back and I said, okay, that I understand that. You don't need a flagpole to play baseball, but when opening day comes and the yard goats take the field and we say, we go to the national anthem and there's 6,000 people all turning to look where the flag is, when the newspaper comes and asks me why isn't there a flag ball at the ballpark, I just have to say, was it the construction company, was it the insurance company, or was it the city that didn't deliver the flagpole? Because you're right, you don't need a flagpole to play baseball. Needless to say, the next day we had a flagpole installed. That's a $71 million ballpark, right? Yes. At 6,000 and change. So you do have standing room only tickets that you sell? We do. So the optimal capacity is what? So the, the maximum capacity is 6,850. We're, we're, we're not looking to go too much more than that because the fan experience is very important to us. So we're probably we're at toward, close to where we want to be on capacity. Tim, talk about the fan experience because I, I think most of the students know, but not everybody knows minor league baseball. The focus, and you alluded to this, is not so much on the field of play, the talent players and the team and the one loss record. It's about the game day experience, right? The family coming and having a good time because you want them to come back. So it's about the experience that they have in that afternoon or evening of baseball. And talk about some of the things you do to enhance that experience. So I often talk to our staff and I make sure they, you know, sometimes we get bogged down in details and I say, remember, we're in the business of putting smiles on people's faces. And if you take that philosophy and you go like there's a, uh, you know, someone's having an anniversary and they're having their party at the ballpark or you're having company outing or you're, you're doing a different event, that's really what it ties down to. And that experience is so important because when you go to, say, Fenway Park or Yankee Stadium and you're going to see names, you're going to see great baseball being played, and I often say I can't compete in baseball, right? I'm in between two major markets that have phenomenal baseball, and we're affiliated with the Colorado Rockies, which means absolutely nothing to many people in the Northeast because of the baseball. So I want our fan experience to be the best it can be. So whether it's the music being played on the, on the, uh, the, uh, the speaker system, the video boards playing the graphics, the uniforms, the merchandise, the food, all those details that are involved, I always want to be the best that we can be because I know we can beat, we can beat them in customer service, we can beat them in fan experience. Uh, I just know we can't beat them in baseball, so we don't, we don't, we don't focus on it. All right, thank you. Let's um, talk about the uh, transition and the rebranding to the Yard Goats. So this essentially is the organization that moved from New Britain, the Rock Cats, to Hartford to become the Yard Goats. Why did the organization not keep the Rock Cats name and just call them the Hartford Rock Cats? Um, that was a good question. That's a great question. So 20 years, the New Britain Rock Cats were you know, in the market. And the decision was made because when you relocate a team, there's multiple reasons why you change the name. One is merchandise. Two is that you're tying it to a different experience. So the Rock Cats experience was in New Britain at the stadium, which was a great experience, but this was a new experience that we're going to have in Hartford. So we want to be very strategic on coming up with a brand and really represent um, the, the baseball fans in Hartford. And tell us a little bit about that transition, starting from scratch, creating a, a new name, a nickname, uh, the mascots. How you come up with all these things? I know you had some uh, community input. Yeah, so we, we did a name the team contest, and we had 6,000 names come in. Um, some great names came in. Some I can't say out loud because they were that rude, but we had 6,000 of them come in. We then took, the, there was four people on the committee, myself, our owner, uh, a marketing company called Brandios. Uh, they're out of California, and a consultant that we were working with, Chuck Domino. And so we were, so every, every day we would get the list of new names that were coming in. And three days before the contest was over, the yard goats came in. 
And it, it, it piqued my interest because I didn't know what a yard goat was. And I'm like, okay, well, let me look, let me Google it and figure out what it is. And uh, yard goat is actually a small train that works in a train yard getting all the cars on track. And the reasoning was, was because, you know, the name, when they submitted the name, they had to have a reasoning. And they said because of the rich history of trains in Hartford, they chose the yard goats. When we broke the name down, yard goats, yard, you know, ties to baseball, the yard, go yard, and goats ties to goats. And like, you know, who doesn't love screaming goats, fainting goats, whatever the case it is. So it became, it was on two of the four lists. It was myself and our consultant that we picked yard goats, and then uh, it was one of our top five, and then uh, our owner and the consultant company didn't see it, and then we started talking about it, and Yard Goats took a lead, and then when we did the name the team contest, uh, we released our top 10 names, and then for final voting, and Yard Goats got the most play, the most, it was the biggest shock factor, and then we chose through fan voting. So we told all our fans that were voting, it may or may not impact the decision, meaning we might pick the name of the team regardless of the voting. Um, I think Yard Goats still won, but we already knew it was going to be the Yard Goats once we saw that. So the Yard Goats are now firmly established and you have a fan following. But I read that initially the Yard Goats was not widely embraced. It was not popular. There was blowback blow and controversy about that name. Absolutely. So we in, so. In minor league baseball, or typically when you do branding, there's two ways to do an unveiling. One is to release the name and the logo at the same time. The other approach, the approach that we did, is you release the name and you say the logo is going to come, and it'll be you know released 90 days later. We released the yard goats. At the day we released it, we became the most hated people in the state of Connecticut. The like, I would get phone calls. I had people with like uh, political connections calling me saying they need to change the name. No one, liked, no one liked the name. And the part of it is that when you think of a name, typically we're very conservative in our thoughts. We think senators, we think capitals, we think very conservative thoughts. But minor league baseball is not marketing towards the conservative side. We're on the, the other side. And you know, we're really focusing on marketing the kids, especially with the name. So um, we, we battled through about, about I'd say, tw two weeks of hate emails, people calling up, telling us we're horrible. Actually, the city of Hartford gave, were getting phone calls. They gave out my phone number, which was my cell phone. So I was getting interesting calls that Saturday night at 11 o'clock telling me what, what kind of person I was for naming the team the Yard Goats. Um, people saying that they'll never come to the ballpark. Uh, you're embarrassing the community, you're embarrassing the state of Connecticut, you know, how dare you? And then 90 days later, we let all that negativity go down, and then 90 days later, we le release the logo, and the logo, you know, gets great, uh, gr uh, great exposure, gets welcome, merchandise sells, sales, we broke the record in minor league baseball for selling the most merchandise in the first 24 hours. I think it was two weeks later we had, we had sold merchandise in every state uh, in, in the country and continues to be a top brand. All right, thank you. Um, I don't know if this is a minor league thing, but based on the teams you mentioned, the Michigan White Caps, the New Hampshire Fisher Caps, the New Britain Rock Caps, the Hartford Yard Goats, how come there's like two words? to all these teams? But it, it flows a lot better, a lot with the marketing, a lot with the, um, the way it looks out on a jersey. It, it's, it's strategically done. There's some teams that just don't get that. So very similar to uh, equating it to, to anything, there's people that get, get it and there's people that don't. So a lot of teams will, will, will say, okay, we could have been the, just the goats, right? Well, the goats don't necessarily identify what it is. Yard goats flows much better. So this was a conscious decision you made. Absolutely. You All the names it. had two so yeah. yeah. That's interesting. And then the mascots, real quickly. So we, we, did, we decided to do mascots. 
And we were along the design of being, again, 16 years in minor league baseball, and I don't know if anyone ever has put a mascot suit on. Uh, it is not uh, enjoyable during the summertime, and that's when we play baseball. So we were actually, we designed a mascot suit that was going to be uh, lightweight, um, cooler than most mascots, and we presented, we presented it to our ownership, and they said, no, we want to go with the crazy look. So we, we ended up coming up with Chompers. And so Chompers was, um, again, we did a name the team contest. And we said, OK, Chompers is going to be our mascot. And then we said, well, I said, we got to order two mascot suits because our mascots are our, really our brand. It's our marquee player. We put them out in the community as much as possible. They get more attention than anyone else. Uh, because they're seven-foot goats, right? Who doesn't want to be around a seven-foot goat? So what I said is we need to order two mascots, and then, then our consultant said, well, then we should make it a different color and make it, uh, uh, make it his female partner, whether it's his wife or his sister or whatever the case it is. And then hence Choo Choo came out. So we had <laughs> Chompers and Choo Choo. All right, talking about the uh, fun aspect of minor league baseball and the yard goats in particular. Uh, you have this alternative nickname, the Steam Burgers. Talk about how that came about and is this an ongoing thing? With yeah, the yeah absolutely. Does anyone know what a Steam Burger is? Is it a Connecticut thing? It's or a or Connecticut a thing. thing. So a hamburger, a Steam Burger is actually exactly what it is. It's ground beef and it's cooked with steam. And so you can imagine what that looks like. The cheese is melted on it. And it is a Connecticut item. And so a lot, a lot of teams were doing was specifically for um, you, you know, celebrating a local food item. And so when I, you know, again, being from New Hampshire, I'm down in Connecticut. And I said, OK, what, what, are, you know, what are some of the unique food con that Connecticut has? And three items came up. Pizza has great, New Haven has great pizza. Peppy's pizza is great. Sally's pizza is great. But pizza can relate anywhere, right? It, you know, New Jersey thinks they have better pizza than Connecticut, whatever, whatever the case may be. The, the next item was lobster rolls due to the seacoast. And I said, OK, that's, that could be a possibility. And then the third item was steamed burgers. And steamed burgers was a, was a um, hands down winner. So we went into, started going into logo design. And you can see. The, the burger, actually, that was the second version of the burger. The first burger came back, and I said, you know what? It's not this. We've got to do something with it. You know, go back to the drawing board. And our creative services uh, director, uh, Caroline, came back, and she said, Tim, you're really going to like this. And I said, what? OK. She goes, he's steaming mad. Get it? And I said, I got it. So we, 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 uh, we tie the uniform has. Uh, you know, the ketchup mustard font. Uh, the hat on the player is actually a 360 degree hat of a cheeseburger, so it goes all the way around. And so those have been very, very popular. And how have these alternative uniforms, nicknames, been embraced by the fans? Do they love it or? They, lo they love it. I mean, one, we can look at the merchandise sales and that we sell a ton of steamed cheeseburger merchandise. Two, it, it breaks up our everyday uniform. So I think we do five times a year we play as the steamed cheeseburger. So that's a nice thing. And it just it's something different that we offer in our store and our fans can see when they come out to a game. All right. Since we're talking about cheeseburgers, let's get to the, um, the creative offerings at the concession. This is not your standard Coca-Cola, hot dog, <laughs> beer. You've got some pretty um, creative uh, menu items here. And I don't know if this is unique to the Hartford Yard Goats at Dunkin' Donuts Park, or is this common across baseball and minor leagues these days? It, it's, it's somewhat common over minor league baseball. So we view Dunkin' Donuts Park as Connecticut's largest restaurant. And to do that, you have to have all types of food. We have vegan options. We have vegetarian options. And then we have other healthy options. And then we have the extreme other side, the non-healthy options. And part of this is that when you hear these food items, you say, oh, like either that's interesting or I'm going to be sick 
or I got to try it, or not on your life. And so, uh, actually, three of these were, uh, well, two of them were uh, creations when I go to speak at sports management classes in the, the town that I live in. And so, engaging high school students at 7 o'clock in the morning is a challenging task. So I typically, after I start talking about what I'm doing, and they're falling asleep, I start talking about food. So these, are, so these first two actually came from high school students with a couple modifications. So on the left-hand side is munchkins wrapped in bacon. So obviously we're Dunkin' Donuts Park. They're munchkins wrapped in bacon. Who doesn't like bacon? Who doesn't like donuts? The one below it is called the, the rice crispy, it's called the crispy chicken sandwich, and crispy's with a K. So it's rice crispy treats uh, as the bun grilled with chicken, lettuce, that's the healthy part, bacon, and then barbecue sauce. And really it's breakfast meets lunch because the rice crispy and the bacon is breakfast and the chicken and the, the lettuce is lunch. And then the top right hand That's is... That's one of your favorites, the glaze and graze. Yeah, glaze and graze, which is a half pound all beef burger with uh, lettuce, that's the healthy part. Spring greens uh, uh, in between two glazed donuts. And then the other item is our loaded tots. Those, that was a new item last year, which is uh, tots with barbecue sauce and onions and all the, all the fun fixings. And we don't have it up here, but another popular item is chicken, chicken and um, waffle bites with a swirl of uh, maple syrup. So you guys come up with these uh, ideas in house, and are there any new? There's items yeah. So lunch? there's new new ones for this year, and again the the sports management class, uh, in the in the town I live with. So we have, I'm trying to think. April first is when we're releasing them, so you have to check out then. But I think there's, we're, there's a um, we're gonna do a chicken tender sandwich. And we're, we're partnering with a gentleman called Dane Drops. He does uh, food reviews. And it's called the Chicken Tender Fender Bender. And so that's one of our chicken tender sandwiches. The, uh, another one is a grill. I think we're going to do like a grilled cheese in between two glazed donuts. So you'll have to stay tuned and, and All right. try it out. April 1st, that's the release date. All right, so um, Minor league season goes, what, 140 games, 70 yep. on the road, 70 at home. So 70 home dates, right? 365 days in a year minus the 70 home dates. That's a lot of dates that, you know, you've got nothing going on or not a game to play in the park. So talk about, you know, the special events and how you go about filling the dates on the calendar for the park programming. So there's, there's really... Two directions. One is during the baseball season. So we do a lot of baseball games. Uh, University of Connecticut plays there. University of Hartford plays there. We play a lot of high school baseball games. The baseball is always going on during the season. And we're somewhat protective of the field. So from April to September, it's basically baseball. Afterwards, we start doing some different events. Uh, the last two years, we did an event called uh, Links at the Yard which we turned the ballpark into a nine-hole golf course. And it was like top, top golf style, but not technology. So it was all target shooting. So you shot golf balls from all the upper level uh, areas of the ballpark onto the field and got points on how close you were to the pin. We do uh, different uh, brew fests. We did a, a CrossFit event. And then we get into other events that we host there, whether it's weddings, bar mitzvahs, uh, we have a prom this year. We utilize the ballpark, probably about 225 different events throughout the year. Yeah, and during the season, I mean, you have all these promotional nights, right? Bobblehead giveaways, a lot of giveaways. You've got ethnic theme nights, and, uh, first responders, all those kinds of things. But you're talking about also non-baseball events to kind of utilize the park and generate additional streams of revenue. Yeah, the, the promotions, I said when we were in... in coming to Hartford the first year, we opened up the doors and we were fortunate people came in. And now I, I said every night we have to have 20 different promotions going on to get people in the ballpark. So whether it's, uh, it's uh, 
you know, Irish night, or whether it's a fundraiser for a local robotics group, or it's a, you know, we have a one millionth fan contest, or whatever the case it is. So many different promotions need to happen because the baseball game's the baseball, and the baseball fans know where we are, and it's great baseball. But all the other fans that are coming out, whether their kids are singing the national anthem or their uh, company is having a uh, outing in uh, in the outfield, those are all the different promotions that we have to uh, set up so that the ballpark is filled. You know, uh, Tim, we told you that uh, the faculty here, the sport management faculty, we were down at the park last summer, and my colleague here, uh, Dr. Dan Kola, was fascinated by one of these promotional items, the beer bat. This is beer, I don't know, 22 ounces served in a cup that's uh, elongated like a baseball bat, and he took a photo of it. But that was something that you guys came up with in-house and worked with a local cup company, and it's been very popular, and other ballparks and teams have, have copied you now. Talk about how that came about. So when we were looking at, um, looking at different ways to you know, make the experience better, or fun, one of the things that we talked about is uh, beer sales. And we sell um, you know, quite a bit of beer there, and we said, well, what if we come up with a unique vehicle? Um, they, the cup company approached us about doing it for soda, but we sell all bottled sodas, so I was looking at the next item that we sell, and um, volume-wise, and it was beer, and we said, what if we take a container and we theme it yard goats, and you were able to sell beer out of it? And I like the idea, so we went into creative design and um, and came up with, you know, we talked about goats and right, well, maybe it's a trash can, maybe it's a goat horn, maybe it's a, uh, a cleat, like, you know, something like a, a, a goat foot or something to drink beer out of. And the designs were good, but I'm like, they're not, they're not doing it. And so um, we said, all right, well, let's get off the goat idea and let's go with baseball. And so let's talk about baseball and then the baseball bat. You know, that's a great item. So we created a 22-ounce beer bat that um, uh, was very, went viral when it, we put it on social media and got to the point that we sold out before the season was even over. So it was a unique item that was uh, able to celebrate. People would buy it. Actually, people, kids would buy it. We learned that we, it's not just for beer. We would sell it at the, uh, the soda stand because... Kids wanted it too, so we're like, we'll, we'll make it available for kids. You don't have to buy a beer. So, Tim, what is the creative process that you go through to come up with new ideas? Because that's the challenge: coming up constantly, <coughs> excuse me, with new. Right? Everybody's got the rally cows and the bobbleheads and <coughs> giveaways from sponsors. But what's the creative process that goes into coming up with new and different? You, you convene your team and. Uh, you sit around the room and brainstorm. How does this work? A lot, a lot of it's brainstorming. A lot of it's creative ideas. I remember one of my first jobs in minor league baseball. We we were sitting around the table and someone said, "What, what are we going to do about this?" And one of my friends had an idea and he said, "This was the idea," and it probably wasn't the best idea, but the general manager said, "That's the stupidest idea I ever heard." So then, at, when we went to the next person. No one wanted to give an idea because all the ideas are stupid. So we breed, we breed creativity. So when someone has an idea, you, you know, whether it's a good idea or a bad idea, you, you, give it, you give it air, you give it life, and then eventually, whether it's going to succeed into something else or it, it, it just goes onto a shelf, we're very trying to breed creativity. We try to you know, in, include as many people in the staff on the ideas because we have a group salesperson who's selling tickets to little leagues and has some of the best ideas for promotional nights, uh, even though his title has nothing to do with promotions. But one, one, we did a Game of Thrones night, and he had like, you know, seven of the ten items was his idea. So we try to breed creativity, let people speak about it, and uh, go from there. Speaking about being creative, or at least being um, avant-garde, uh, the reason why you, you, we played that song, Take Me Out to the Ball Game, with the, the lyrics modified for the yard goat, but they took out that line about peanuts and Cracker Jacks, is because the yard goats were the first ballpark in all of baseball to ban peanuts. And 
you know, based product. Can you talk about how that came about? And Absol absolutely. So just by a show of hands, does anyone either have no uh, relative or friend that has a peanut allergy? Wow. Right? <laughs> That's, there's more people that know peanut allergies that have been to Dunkin' Donuts Park, by the way. That's interesting. Yeah, so, so we met with, uh, uh, through a sponsor, a high-level sponsor, said, hey, listen, we need you to meet with um, uh, two people that work for me that have kids that have food allergies. And so I have a food and beverage background. That's how I got into the business. And so we were meeting and um, talking about, you know, what they do for food allergies. And we had done like two nights during the year. We did peanut-free nights. And they came to them and they were explaining how they were explaining how great it was and how they still had to wipe down the seats and they when they went to the bathroom they wiped down the uh, the fixtures. And I asked the mother and I said, "Where do you take your kids out to eat?" And they're like, "We don't, because if there's one mistake, it's a 911 call." And these kids had beyond peanut allergy; they had bigger allergies. And so I got home. And um, I have uh, two nephews that one of them has a peanut allergy. And I realized, I said, you know, I've invited them down. Like, in the world of uncles, I'm the best uncle you could ever have, right? I have access to a field. You want to play catch, we'll go on the field. Like, you know, you want to go in the batting cage. I'm, I have to be one of the best uncles, at least in my mind. And so they never would come down. And I realized one of my nephews had a peanut allergy. So I went home and I said, how many peanuts do we sell, right? So we, how many bags of peanuts? So we sold 10,000 bags of peanuts at four bucks a bag, okay? Well, what else do we sell with peanuts? Cracker Jacks, okay. Yeah, it's in the song, makes sense. We sold 2,500 bags of peanuts at four bucks a bag. So the hit was, so if you add it all up, there's $50,000 a year in peanut sales. So we said, what if we got rid of them, right? What would that do? A little backlash, we think. The food sales, because we're a business, right? So the food sales, we feel those, those sales would go to something else. We would get like sunflower seeds or, or uh, you know, pretzels or whatever the case it is. So we presented to ownership that you know, we think this is something we should do. And our owner, explained to me one of the times when he had to bring a friend of his uh, sons to the game and the, the length that a conversation he had to have with the parents about, even though he owns the team and he has a suite, how his kid was going to go into the ballpark. And we finally realized that if you eliminate one food item and you allow, you allow so many more people to come to the ballpark, it was a no-brainer. So we announced it. And it's funny, I had to when we announced it, I had to literally beg the newspaper to come to the unveiling because I knew it was going to be a big story. I didn't realize how big it was, but it got national news. Like, I got interviewed by USA Today. I got interviewed uh, the New York Times, Washington Post. It was on every market TV uh, in the country. The, the, the amount of exposure that we got was great, and the amount of positive letters that I got was awesome. And then I got some funny emails. I've been called communist. I should leave the country. Uh, I'm destroying baseball. Um, and so, but nonetheless, we made the decision. If you notice, we even changed the words. And then everyone noticed who was singing the song? There were kids singing the song. You know why we picked kids? Well, one, it's to make sure everyone understands why we're doing it, right? It's, and so um, we, brought, we had kids sing this song so that they understood why we're doing it. It's for kids, and whether you have a peanut allergy or not, that's why we're making the change. So you should be saluted for doing this changeover because it was a financial hit to it, never mind the tradition-laden sport of baseball and, and some of the fans who were not happy about it. Right? Yeah, but and a lot of, you know, it's funny. I went to baseball winter meetings, and a lot of people talked to me about it. But there's a lot of fear, right? So the fear is the change. And I, I would talk to someone, they'd call me up, and they would tell me what kind of person I was for taking away their rights to, you know, they couldn't eat peanuts. And I said, no, you can eat peanuts at home. You can eat peanuts in the car. You just can't eat peanuts in the ballpark. 
And I literally, you know, um, the amount of, like, there was emails that would always come in, and I learned not to respond to them because you just, doesn't matter what you're going to do. They're going to be negative all the time. But I've had a lot of conversations with people, and they said, you know what? I didn't realize that. I didn't know what a peanut allergy was. And then, you know, it was there. All right. Thank you. Uh, let's talk about this honor of hosting the uh, 2021 uh, Eastern League All-Star Game, which really is a salute to you, your organization, and the Dunkin' Donuts Park. But um, tell us about how this came about and the honor that it is to you and the organization. Yeah, it was, it was very exciting. Literally, the first day on April 13, 2016, when we threw the first pitch, my goal was to get that ball and present it to our ownership. And I did, and our league president was there, and I said, at that date, I'm like, we're ready for the All-Star game. And so after seeing what we do out in the community, our community programs, what we, how, we, how we treat our fans at the ballpark, the players' experience at the ballpark, never mind the fans, the league came to us and asked us if we wanted to host the 2021 All-Star game, which is absolutely, we were so excited. If you haven't been to Dunkin' Donuts Ballpark, it's a 360-degree ballpark, so you actually can walk in the outfield all the way around. And I can't think of a better ballpark in minor league baseball to host a home run hitting contest to be able to have fans in the outfield trying to catch foul balls. So we're a home runs. So we're very excited to be able to host it and showcase the the area, the city, and uh, and uh, bring everyone to Hartford. All right, Tim. Thank you for that. Hey, now is the time for you to ask Tim your questions. Ask the president of the Hartford Yard Goats any questions that you would like to pose to him. We've got a microphone runner. If you don't mind standing, stating your name and major, that'd be great. Um, my name's Alex Sarkis. I'm a sports management major. And um, when the Hartford Yard Goats moved, well, when they, you guys moved to Hartford in 2016, was it a daunting task to be president of the team, knowing you have a lot of you have pretty big shoes to fill since the Hartford Whalers have been gone since 90 to, uh, 1997? It's I'm sorry, it's Alex, right? Yes. Yeah. So Alex, I, I literally um, when when I got when I at the time there was sometimes I realized like I'm like I'm so beyond my skis, right? I'm <laughs> like I'm like you know fake it till you make it type thing, and there's so much detail that goes into getting a ballpark, an organization, up and running. And I equated to like doing a restaurant, right? You have to open a restaurant. That can be a daunting task. But if you break it down by one fork, one spoon, one knife at a time, it's not rocket science, right? So what we would do is we would literally do that with everything. And some of the, th some of the things that I learned, I have a philosophy. It's called GSD get stuff done, or you can replace stuff with something else. And so that part of it is so much things that we would do that we would try to get off the plate so that we could put more things on our plate as it was coming was very overwhelming. I remember multiple times saying, what am I doing, right? And then, you know, the part of it is that, um, you know, you have a plan, you're trying to execute it, but then when it executes and you're like, wow, that was really right. Like, you know, then the next thing's right and the next thing's right. And all of a sudden you're like, what's, what's wrong? What are we going to fix? Because we want to make it the best experience. Uh, it, was, it was very overwhelming. But the part of it is that, you know, you breathe, you take one foot step forward, the next step, the next thing, the next thing, and you just take it one day at a time. So great question, Alex. Hi, um, Kevin McKay here, uh, sport management major. Was it uh, difficult for you transitioning from the food service industry to the sports industry? Kevin, it, it, it was. It wasn't as long, as hard as I thought because it was, food was comfortable, right? I mean, I had, you know, in high school I worked at McDonald's, Friendly's, I worked at all these food places. Listen, I eat food. So it was very comfortable to me to work in food. But when I... And I had, a, I had a lot of anxiety when I made the change because I wasn't in my comfort zone. 
But I finally realized, I'm like, the way I get became be successful is just doing it. And when I stopped worrying about what I was going to fail, and what I was then I just worried about what I had to do, I started succeeding. And a lot of things, you know, the part of it is that again, you, you whether it's food service or it's business operations or it's sales or marketing, you know, your work ethic is the same. Your comfort level might be a little different, but once I got over my comfort level of making mistakes and you know you do make mistakes i was able to be you know start to excel and do more and that a lot of it tied to that gsd philosophy of just get it done and then move on to the next thing and the next thing all right we got about 5 more minutes this is cameron cole he's the president of the sport management association excellent uh, thank you Thank you for coming today. Uh, my question to you, uh, Cameron Coe, as you just said, senior sport management and marketing major. Uh, my question to you is, uh, what is your biggest, biggest piece of advice for those of us entering the sport industry very shortly? Good question, Cameron. So I often, I do a lot of informal uh, conversations or informational conversations with uh, college students. And usually when I get an email, and this isn't an open email type thing, but like a lot of times they're like, oh, I have to do a paper. And I usually respond because I know when I was in college, I probably had to do tonight at 5 o'clock and I just emailed at 3 o'clock. So. But the part of it is I always say is that I go, understand sales. Like a lot of times sales is not considered the uh, sexy part of sports, but it's so important and you use it every single day. And so understand sales, whether it's a sales class or how the sales process works, because the first thing you're going to do is you're selling yourself, right? And if you're not a salesman, then you know, you're not going to be able to sell yourself to an organization. So understanding that process, understanding how it works, and knowing it, you know, and I, I equate it to like, you know, when you first, you know, you play basketball, the first time you pick up a ball compared to now, the, the only way you get better is practice, right? So understanding sales and then realizing it's a game. You know, part of it, a lot of times I'll, I'll go into a class, I'm like, who, who here knows how to sell something? And no one knows how to sell. And I'm like, okay, well, you're trying to sell yourself. And you've, you've done sales. You've, you've sold your parents on, I want to stay up 10 more minutes past my bedtime because I want to watch what's on TV. You've been doing sales all your whole life. But once you realize that process, that's a big part of it. Good question. Next question, we got time for two more. Yeah, my name is Gavin Hartley. I'm a senior sport management major. I was just wondering what your take is on how the MLB handled the whole Astros uh, sign stealing scandal. Uh, Thanks, Gavin. Put yeah, good spot. question, Gavin. <laughs> so um, a lot of times we don't focus on the baseball because it's not what we control. Um, I learned, so I'll talk about my, my take on when you make a mistake and when you do something, is that you need to own up for it, you need to clean it up, and you need to move on. And those are three things. Until you get to those, those items that you do, it will continue to make a new cycle and keep going around and around and around until you clean it up because it's not going to go away. It's, a, it's amazing when you bring 6,000 people into a downtown Hartford and the economic impact with restaurants, with parking lots, with people becoming comfortable to come back down there. We haven't been able to, we haven't focused on measuring it yet. It's something that we've talked about this year. But the jobs that we create, the, uh, the vendors, the businesses that we use, all those things, it's just, I, I don't know what that number is. We were at literally talking about it this week because we're talking about our energy efficiencies at the ballpark. So we talked about what is, you know, what does one fan mean to economic impact? Because we measure that at the ballpark with food per caps, per capita, merchandise per capita. We're actually looking at how to measure that for the whole area because it's something that I think 
uh, talking to restaurant owners, they've seen it in, they see an increase on game day. We talk to parking lots, they've definitely seen the increase. And so it definitely makes an impact. Thank you. Tim, I know you can talk a lot longer, but we've got to wrap this up. We're at the top of the hour. I just want you to explain why you brought this baseball bat as a prop here, because uh, I knew you wanted to say something about it. So uh, absolutely. So there's two things about the baseball bat. It's one, the bat opens my door every single day, so that I always have an open door philosophy. Because no one wants to come in to the president's office. They're all afraid of me. Um, even though I'm not a bad guy, but they're always afraid of me, so I always have that. And this bat, uh, I actually used, I did a tour, and I actually grabbed the bat when I was doing the tour, and we were just opening the ballpark. And so we do the whole tour, and these are all vice presidents of insurance companies. This is all a bunch of, you know, probably about 30 different level executives coming through. And when I ended the tour, I did it in the batting cage. And I said, hey, guys, I brought my bat so you guys could take BP. That day, we sold 30 season tickets to people because of their experience at the ballpark with this bat. So I always, I always and, and a bat is an emotional tie. So obviously, you, you know, I've gone to meetings and I brought the bat. People always want to grab it, right? And they always want to swing it. And it brings them back to those days. So the emotional selling, the prop, the prop piece always puts a smile on people's faces. So, the good news, uh, Kurt, I didn't have to use the bat tonight, so I appreciate you guys having me up here. All right, Tim, thank you very much for a delightful evening and coming all the way up to Western New England and uh, sharing a little bit about you and your background and your organization, and we wish you much success going forward this season and beyond. Let's give it up for Tim Westcott. <laughs> I'd like to invite uh, the president Cameron Coe, on behalf of the Sport Management Association, to make a presentation here. Thank you for coming. Absolutely. Oh, very cool. So this is for you. Thank you. And Dean, Dr. Oh, Sherry Ann Walker. I appreciate it. Yeah, very nice to meet you, Cameron. This is a traditional presentation we make here. So I'd like everybody to attend to for just one moment before you start out the door. I'd like to invite up to join me in the presentation, Professor Paul Costanza. And for those of you who don't know Professor Costanzo uh, in the sport management area, you're about to know him even a little bit more. It's my pleasure to announce officially to the group that Professor Costanzo has joined the sport management department. And while he is teaching and marketing, he is going to be focusing on things like sport sales for us next year and sport communication. And he's going to expand our wonderful faculty. And so please welcome me and the person on the other side. <laughs> I'm glad I mentioned the, the sports piece. Uh, it's my pleasure with Professor Costanzo, our newest member, to present him with this lovely uh, presentation, a plaque for your experience here this evening, for you to hang in the office. And I just want to say, we're so glad you're here. And welcome to the Golden Bear family, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Look, look right here, guys. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. With that, class is dismissed. Thank you for coming. We'll see you at the next one. Thank you. On many fronts, but one explains these.